Mr. Graham, welcome to the podcast. It is a pleasure to have you here today. It's good to be here, Lucas. Now let's start back at the beginning. I want to go back. So you grew up in Virginia and you went to James Madison High School. Now I'm really curious about 16-year-old Alexander Graham. Can you take us into your high school experience? Were there any key pivotal points in that time? Did you have a specific mindset? Just take us back to that time period in your life. Sure. Well, I have to come clean. I was not in FBLA. Um, and uh, I now regret that, of course. Um, but I was not a member of FBLA. And actually, when I think back to some of the programs that we had, um, I know that that high school today has a very vibrant mm -hmm. FBLA program. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute because uh, that was part of my uh, interview and candidacy process for coming to work for FBLA. So things do come full circle. Uh, when I was in high school um, and I was 16 years old, I actually worked at an animal hospital. And um, I think at that point in my life, uh, I really thought that I wanted to become a veterinarian. And so I would spend pretty much most of my time outside of school uh, working for what was then an emergency animal hospital. It was a new concept where, unfortunately, things happen to people's pets and their animals um, when uh, veterinarian offices are closed. You know, normally they're open from sort of a nine to five, and many aren't open on the weekends. And so uh, it was a pretty interesting experience uh, to work there um, as a veterinary assistant, working with the doctors, working with the technicians. Um, and it was uh, a big part of my life at that point. Uh, as you can see, I did not go on to get my DVM. Uh, now I took a very different academic um, yeah, sure. tact, but I think that's what being young is all about. You explore things and, and see what kind of catches fire. Um, I still enjoy, uh, um, thinking about the idea of working with animals. In fact, I'm joined today by my best friend and I'll show her to you. <laughs> you can see her, I'm not sure if you can. Awesome, gotta love when the dog makes an appearance. There she is. <laughs> yeah, of course, if, I, any, if all else fails, go for the dog, right? You know, it makes exactly. everybody happy. Uh, but that's Clementine. And so she's uh, my sidekick today. Awesome, so you kind of mentioned that there, how you wanted to be a vet, but obviously that's not what you went to become. And so you have a degree in political science and organizational effect effectiveness, and then your MBA. And I'm curious about that switch that you made, because well, like as a jun as going to be a junior this year, I'm thinking about colleges and what I want to do and what careers I want to pursue. And it's a daunting task, and I'm sure others will attest to that as like, oh, do I want to commit to this area and go down this track sure, in life? Sure. Can you give some insight into your college experience and like how you were able to choose and what would you say to teens like myself? Well, I would say that um, I am a huge believer on following a passion. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that also being young gives you an opportunity to explore a lot of different areas that you have a passion or beliefs in. Um, for me, when I, uh, when I look back on where were my skills, um, if I were to, which I will not share in my high school transcripts, but if I were to share those, you would see that I had very strong skills in English in um, uh, more of the liberal arts side of things than maybe I had in the sciences, um, which is to say, I think also when you're young, you tend to, you tend to go in directions um, that maybe, um, maybe you're led there versus, you know, by people around you. So it's always good to get advice, but I think you should also follow your heart. So when I went off to college, um, uh, I was very fortunate. I went to a, a, a four-year uh, private liberal arts college. Um, it was relatively small. In fact, it was just a little bit bigger than my actual high school, which was really? interesting. Wow. Uh, yeah, compared to a lot of my friends that went to the larger state universities like a, a Virginia Tech yeah. uh, or a University of Virginia. Um, but that environment was really beneficial for me, uh, particularly majoring in political science which I have always found public policy, politics, um, legislation, regulation, I find that very interesting. Um, both the political side of it, which is the kind of the people part, but then the policy side, which is the more technical um, aspects to it. So for me, I just found that really interesting. Um, when I went off to school uh, and I took my first handful of classes in that I was undeclared as a major, but I really enjoyed the professors, I enjoyed the idea of um, the dialogue that came with it, uh, 
and I think I brought some very good communications and writing skills with me. So sometimes you feel a little success and you begin to pursue something and it sort of all works out in, in that vein. So for my undergraduate degree, um, the political science route just seemed natural for me uh, and I very much enjoyed it. My minor was in modern European history, which is a bit of a nerd subject, but that has to do with um, most people consider modern European history sort of everything after the American Revolution, but it was very okay. focused on Europe. Uh, so certainly on Russia, France, England. Um, so it was interesting for me. Um, I very much enjoyed it. And again, it gave me an opportunity to really continue to flex those communications abilities. Um, I think being able to communicate both um, one-on-one -on -one as a speaker or in writing is just critical, really, regardless of whatever career path you take, uh, those skills are indispensable wherever you go or whatever subject matter you pursue. If someone is a teenager out there and they're looking to develop their communication skills, because you always hear that, like teachers will say, hey, you have to be able to communicate. And you might read right. it in a book somewhere, like communication is a great skill to have, but how can teens develop that? Are there any like concrete steps that you can take to improve in that area? I think most things like that are a muscle. You just have to continue to work mm. it for it to get stronger. So the more of it you do, um, the better off you are. I think that's one of the, the really phenomenal aspects to FBLA um, is, the, is the, the fact that it requires students to communicate, whether they're giving a presentation or even if they're just preparing for a competition uh, or in the very heart of their chapter, if they choose a leadership role or maybe they're just helping out with a particular community service, project, they have to be able to articulate what it is they're doing either within the chapter or externally to uh, individuals they're trying to get involved um, or help or, or even within their school setting, making sure administrators understand what their chapter is all about and what they're trying to do with, with FBLA. So I think that it's definitely that muscle that you just have to continue to work um, both and that's not just, you know, a lot of people think in today's world where we are extremely digital. I mean, here you and I are communicating from across mm -hmm. the country um, using Zoom, which is terrific. Um, sure. So great. We have great verbal rapport. Uh, but I think written skills are so important and following through on that. Uh, writing is one of those things that, um, again, it's always going to be important wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whether you're sending a quick email to people you're making an Instagram post, yes, it might be very visual, but if you can't turn a phrase, you're not gonna hold people for very long. For sure, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the writing part because communication definitely is not just speaking, it is that writing part. And that's something that I've definitely had to work on is being able to speak with adults and peers through email, like you said, and then that social media aspect as well, getting your point across and being able to deliver that message is huge. And we've talked about this a little bit about FBLA and PBL. And for those that are unfamiliar with the organization, that's Future Business Leaders of America. That's a business CTSO. It's a club in high school that you can join. And so Mr. Graham is our president and CEO currently. And you mentioned this kind of before you kind of teased it there of your getting into this position and that opportunity that arose from that. Can you take us into how you became the president and CEO of this organization? Sure, sure. So um, I've spent most of my career working in um, nonprofit membership organizations. So I've worked for a variety of them over the years. I started out working in public policy and legislative and regulatory work. Uh, yes, you, I'll use that term lobbyist. So I worked in that environment. And I tended at that point to work for large trade associations, which represent an entire industry. And as my career moved forward, I started to work more for individual professional associations that were more targeted around a profession, not an entire industry. Um, so the example there is um, for a good bit of time, I worked for an organization called Printing Industries of America. And that is the trade association that represents printing companies across North America. Um, at one time, printing in the United States was America's largest small business. In other words, there were, it was the largest number of um, small businesses in a particular industry. And print was everywhere, literally newspapers, magazines, catalogs. Um, uh, your Starbucks cup is printed. Most people don't realize that, but that's <laughs> actually printing on there. Um, your credit card is actually a form of printing. So um, 
a very interesting industry and very fortunate to be able to work there, particularly in public policy. I actually managed their political action committee. So I got to know what it's like to raise money in politics and be able to support candidates that were um, uh, aligned with the mission of the organization and with uh, the areas uh, that they focused on, which had to do with employment issues, uh, certainly um, small business related issues. So um, most of my career was has been spent in that kind of an environment. And as I worked, um, as I said, I moved towards more of the professional associations, most recently working for the Council for Exceptional Children, which uh, has a beautiful name, but maybe not as clear to people that it's actually the association that represents teachers who work in special education across um, North America, also both the United States as well as Canada. And so that's sort of how I made my way into the world of, of education uh, as, um, as an association professional. And that's how I found myself uh, considering the opportunity to join all of you at FBLA PBL. Yeah, so at the time at the Council for Exceptional Children, serving in that role for those that may be like less fortunate or kind of have an unfortunate circumstance in life, but making sure that they have the best possible outcome and opportunities available. <clears throat> what was that like serving in that role? Because obviously you could go be a CEO for a big corporation or a political, some, something like that, but you chose to serve for students and kids that needed that help. What did that teach you about yourself and what was that experience like? Well, I think that um, I was very fortunate to serve uh, as the CEO of the Council for Exceptional Children. Um, most people look at something like special education and think that that's actually something that happens to someone else. Mm -hmm. um, when in fact, uh, it's actually guaranteed in the law. And so um, most uh, most students, in fact, I think it's something upwards of 80% of all students that receive special education services are actually in the general education classroom. Mm -hmm. So it's a fundamental aspect of how we provide education in the United States. And most importantly, um, it's all part of the federal legislation that's behind it, which provides a free and appropriate public education for all students. Um, so when people think about special education, they may not always realize that thanks to the hard work that was done in the 1970s in the United States um, around essentially civil rights or education rights for individuals with disabilities, um, we actually have a very robust education system for all, not just those um, who may just seem like the typical learner, but for all learners and that it should be delivered to them really in the, um, in the most natural or least restrictive environment for that particular student. So it's definitely something I have a passion for. Mm -hmm. I think education is the great equalizer um, across our nation. And I think it's one of those things that we um, as a society should be investing and focused on more, uh, particularly during these times. I mean, we're seeing the challenges that we have with the COVID-19 pandemic mm -hmm. and how just even providing access for students is really challenging. Definitely. Education is huge and definitely like investing in that, like you said, for students right now is definitely something that needs to be done. And so you have a quote that you mentioned in a video before, and I'll read that now. And it goes back to FBLA and our organization, I think is really inspiring and kind of sums up what we're trying to do. And that's, this was in response to the COVID-19 situation and moving forward. And that is, we need to be much more than an organization that is built upon periodic conferences. We have to be a 365 day a year experience. And from my time in FBLA, this is what sets it apart. It isn't just those conferences and a few events here and there. It's the family that's built up. It's the connections and network that's built up. Can you speak to this quote and kind of explain what makes this organization so special? Well, I think, um, I think you've done a great job in describing that yourself. Um, I'm relatively new to this. I've been able to be a part of the organization since last, last August. So just a year, actually, mm -hmm. just uh, I celebrated my year anniversary. What is it? Uh, two days ago, August oh, wow. 1st. Congratulations. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I would say that what I have witnessed in the leaders, the student leaders that I've met and directly with the members that I've been fortunate enough to meet is is just how powerful the organization is. And yes, those times of coming together, the conferences, 
whether they be at the state or the national or even a regional level, mm -hmm. it's a very special time for many students because it's very affirming. But I wouldn't want students to feel that that's the only reason to be part of the organization, particularly in a time where, unfortunately, due to health concerns, we just can't gather like yeah. we once did. So it's just very critical that people understand that there is more to the organization, but it's also a responsibility of the organization's leadership to make sure that we're building into the experience um, something that can stand not just the test of time, but also the test of, of, of something like a pandemic where we're able to deliver direct to the students. I was so impressed with our members and particularly our local and state advisors, mm. uh, which is really, you know, they are the workforce of FBLA, Definitely. PBL. And they came through in such an incredible fashion for us to be able to conduct our national leadership experience, which was uh, not the same thing as the conference that mm -hmm. we usually have, that we traditionally have, but it was definitely a rich experience where we were able to uphold our, our competitive events and bring those to conclusion. We were also able to um, uh, provide professional development and access to leadership training for our members. So I think that was just a really important um, moment, but it all came together around people who were using skills, it wasn't just about a conference. It was it was really people banding together across the country. I think you can hear my friend in the background getting a little <laughs> you can anxious. Hear. So, yeah, hang on a second. Let me let her out. Yep, you're good. I'll be right back. So with FBLA going into the school year, things are obviously going to look different for our members, our chapters, our conferences, of course. What would you say to a local chapter officer out there, or a state officer for that matter, moving forward? Because there's a lot of uncertainty, at least on the local level of how we're gonna get members and how we're gonna hold different things. Do you have any advice or any recommendations that you give to people like that? I think that uh, it really comes back to um, being creative and looking mm -hmm. at what we can do versus mourning the loss of what we can't do. Yes. So definitely, you know, given the public safety concerns, we're not gonna be having large scale conferences for a while. And we're all keeping an eye on that because we do wanna bring that back. We all realize that that is what gets people excited. But I also think that in talking to so many students and members, as well as advisors, it's not the whole experience. So I would just really urge local chapter leaders um, and members to begin to think differently about what, what, what does value look like in this new environment they're in? How do we create value together? I know that we are at the National Center working very hard to reimagine how we're delivering services. Uh, we just launched a, a collaborative community powered by Higher Logic to support all of our um, uh, advisors mm -hmm. across um, the US, um, particularly for middle level, high school, and PBL, the collegiate division. Uh, we're also looking at how will we um, look at programming differently, uh, the competitive events, how, you know, what did we learn from this past spring and how we delivered competitive events in a completely different format than we've ever really done before. So I just keep coming back to, um, you have to think about creativity, ingenuity, you know, what's that famous expression, you know, um, necessity is the mother of invention, right? Yes. So we need to do things differently now. And let's, let, let's not be bound by what it used to be, but what it might be going forward. Definitely. Flexibility is a must this year, and it should be in any year going forward. And you mentioned something about values and what's valuable. And as a leader of an organization like yourself, what do you value in leadership and leading an organization? What are some of your values that you kind of take with you every single day? I really think it's um, perseverance. You mm -hmm. just have to keep trying. And um, what comes with that is, yes, you're definitely going to fail from time to time. You're going to make mistakes. You got to learn from those, pick yourself up and move on. And, you know, for most things in life, um, these are not, you know, fatal, fatal decisions or fatal flaws that come along. Things can be worked on, there's always a plan B, and from plan B, you can move to plan C pretty quickly. And I think those are things that I value in leaders. Um, I think that when you hold on to things, uh, particularly um, when you just know it's not gonna work, um, you're really best to just move to the next, move to the next opportunity. Um, 
not giving up, but trying to find a way around it. I'm curious with this being nearly basically one year, one full year as the CEO and president of FBLA, what have been some things that you have learned from the members specifically? Because they always talk about like how students can teach the teachers and teachers teach the students. And I'm curious if that applies with you as well. Are there any things that stick out to you that members have taught you about yourself, about leadership, about life, about anything? Well, I think um, absolutely. I've learned so much, particularly uh, our two teams of national officers this year uh, were phenomenal. They worked uh, in a very uh, challenging environment as we started to approach the situation um, with the COVID-19 pandemic. And really, I feel that they became our adjunct staff. Um, they were working social media on behalf of the staff. They were helping communicate messages um, as we, as I think about um, Phi Beta Lambda and the Career Connections Conference last fall, that team was integral into pulling off that conference from the promotion all the way through to the delivery of the conference where they literally led teams of their colleagues on business tours in Manhattan, meeting with some of the best brands um, in the world, not just here in the United States, but in the world. And so I've learned a tremendous amount of um, everything from, I would say, professionalism to how our, our leaders, our student members and leaders comport themselves. Um, also, their enthusiasm is really, um, it's catching. Like you, you get around our student members and our leaders and you can't help but get excited about whatever the project is that we're working on. Even if it's fairly mundane, like, you know, literally stuffing name badges in the middle of a hotel in New York City, we're all doing it together just to make it great for those 300 PBL members that came for Career Connections as an example. Um, so I've, I've definitely learned a lot uh, over the past year. Um, and it's also been helpful because um, as we face some of these challenges, a lot of the solutions were coming from our students themselves mm -hmm. about what they were willing to do. Sometimes I think that um, adult leaders uh, tend to not, tend to be a little bit more risk averse and concerned that maybe people won't um, go for some sort of a change or it won't work. But I think that in many ways, our student leadership really helps us see those possibilities and be able to take the risk uh, and see where we go. I'm really curious about what you just said there about risk and adult being risk averse. And that is kind of something that does get brought up with teens being able to take those risks and kind of just go for it. Can you take us into the process of when a challenge pops up, when you have the option to go for it and maybe be a little on the risky side or kind of sit back and play it safe, take us into that process of what it's like to be the leader of anything and going through that risk taking process. Well, actually it comes back to just core business skills. Um, as we were charged by our board of directors to um, address the fact that we were not going to be able to have the National Leadership Conference in Salt Lake City. Uh, we were studying this pretty carefully through the month of March to figure out what our options were. But very quickly, we created a series of scenarios using core business skills, budgeting, accounting, um, communications, marketing, all those things that make up FBLA, um, PBL. And we um, really created a series of scenarios so while we, there was a risk factor, was anybody going to show up? Um, we didn't know how far things would go with the pandemic, um, what kind of impact that would really have. Uh, we also had obligations to the city of Salt Lake and to the hotels and the convention center there, financial obligations that we had to navigate. So there was a ton of risk involved in all of that. But um, I feel that, again, it goes back to those core business skills and um, planning and working through scenarios uh, and also good leadership. Um, we were able to return back to our board of directors with a series of concepts and they gave us the direction in terms of what they wanted us to be able to achieve for our members and we kept our mission. I think that's another thing that's really important. Always keep your mission at the heart of what you're doing and we um, do that quite a bit. Um, in fact, some people might say I use it like a weapon uh, around the National Center to keep everybody focused. Um, so that's, that's really how I would describe that process of risk for us. Um, 
it's really about preparation, thinking things through, uh, and having having an understanding of okay, what if it doesn't fully go your way? What's what are the ramifications? What will that look like? We were very fortunate. Uh, on a typical year, we'll have 13,500 attendees of the National Leadership Conference. Um, we came very close. I think we were right around 12,000 attendees for wow. both PBL and FBLA participants, which is really uh, a tremendous testament, again, to the students as members, but also to our advisors. Um, they really made it happen from getting the students registered to making sure they were ready for the competitive events that they competed in at the state level under difficult circumstances and then moving on to the national level. And then getting through that whole process, many people don't realize that behind the, the competitive events at the national level is anywhere from 350 to 400 judges that will actually mm -hmm. work as volunteers um, to support the competitive event process. So um, there was a lot of risk, but there was also a lot of opportunity. And I think that at the end of the day, I'm very proud that FBLA PBL is really one of three CTSOs across the United States that was able to field a full national leadership experience for its members. Yeah, very impressive of what we were able to do on each level there. And I'm, you just mentioned there, Mr. Graham, about keeping the mission and that you use that every single day of FBLA. And I think that's really important for our listeners because it doesn't just have to be the mission of an organization because not everyone obviously is even a part of an organization but the mission for yourself, the mission for your life or whatever you do, I think is super important to always keep in mind and kind of be that North Star that's always kind of leading you throughout whatever you do. And so moving forward for teens looking into the future, looking into that next chapter of their life, what do you see our world needing? What are some things that are gonna be in high demand, whether that's a skill or maybe a certain area of expertise are there anything any in particulars that you would suggest or kind of shed light on to someone listening hey i never thought of that this might be a great area to get into can you share some of that yeah i would i would like to make some comments around that because i think that the subject matter is less important than mm -hmm. a handful of maybe you could call them skills um and i think really it comes down to having um having uh real work, work or real world experiences that you can bring to a position that you're seeking. Um, yes, you need to have the subject matter expertise. So if you're studying, you know, accounting or information systems or, you know, you name whatever it is, yes, you should have an expertise at that subject matter. But probably equally as important is um, around those skills that you only gain from that real world work experience. And I encourage all, um, really all young people, youth that I encounter um, to be out there doing job shadowing, to be doing internships, whether they're paid or unpaid. I also really encourage them to not devalue experiences that they're having. Um, let's say that they're, um, their summer position that all they could get this summer is babysitting. You know, there are skills, there's time management, there's a huge amount of um, work that goes into that. It's everyday life skills that can be converted into scenarios that an employer will really appreciate. And I think that if I could give any advice to anybody as they're working on their career and they're seeking perhaps a position, maybe it's, um, maybe it's in their career or maybe it's just a first time position that they're very eager for, is they need to be able to explain to that hiring manager, what they're going to be able to bring to that position on day one. How are they going to be able to help the mission of that company, that department, that work team, or that individual on day one? And I think that that's often lost, where people um, are usually in a job interview trying to tell you how much they know. And instead, I think they should be saying, how much are they willing to do? Um, how much can they bring right away? And I think that also underscores some of the great value in FBLA PBL, not just the subject matter of learning, let's say accounting or something like that, but what can you actually do with that? Anybody can score high on a test, mm -hmm. can you operationalize that in a, work, in a workplace setting. So I just wanna say to your listeners, um, uh, particularly if they're in their early career development phases, don't underestimate or undervalue 
any of the work that you're doing, always be thinking about what am I really doing here and what would that what would that mean to someone else? What would that really value to them? I was talking to uh, a friend of my family and he's been working in his family business, which is in the food service industry. And he really devalued that experience to me. And I said, um, well, tell me more about it. Well, it turns out he was managing inventory. Uh, he would be doing all the bank deposits, settling up the registers, making sure everything balanced every day. He ended up having a critical role that any real employer would be really um, impressed with and would really value. So that's where I think that people ought to be um, spending their energy. Yes, please. I'm not trying to say don't develop your expertise in a particular subject matter. But while you're doing that, make sure that you have those practical real world experiences that can translate into value for an employer uh, and I think that goes um, as you're going into a four-year degree or maybe you're going into, um, into higher ed in and in a bigger capacity through a master's program. Many times you're working in cohorts um, mm -hmm. with colleagues. So again, all those things come into play as to how you bring value to what you do. You have to be able to turn your knowledge and put that to action, which will then in turn provide value to that company, to yourself, to whatever you do in life. One final question I have, and I ask all my guests this, and it's kind of the mission, like we were just talking about, about this whole podcast, and that's developing great team leaders. And I want to hear your opinion or your thoughts on what distinguishes great team leaders from average and ordinary high schoolers that don't go on to lead. I, I just keep coming back to that word, um, perseverance, that the idea that um, people don't give up. And it seems that when you really look at leadership across the board, um, it is that ability to persevere that is so important. And I certainly see it across uh, a lot of the members and the, certainly the leaders at the chapter level or at the state level. And certainly when we see them on our national officer teams, um, these are people that just don't give up. They keep working at something and working at it, testing things, trying things and moving forward. So. That's really what I see um, as, a, as a key quality um, for someone who is developing themselves as a leader is just don't give up. Um, and, and I guess added to that, part of that perseverance is don't be afraid to ask for help. You don't have to go it alone. That's not how the world works. People seldom do things alone. Um, sure. Most of the time we are working in teams or um, even if it's a smaller team, and that is critical to be able to have that give and take with others. Um, we're much stronger when we work that way. Have to be able to ask for help and persevere. That is some great advice to anyone listening, not just teens, anyone at any point in their life. Mr. Graham, where would you send people to learn more about FBLA, what it is, maybe how to join? Where would you send listeners? Well, of course, I'd send them to our website, um, fblapbl.org, um, where you can find lots of information. I also think that um, for our listeners, um, if you don't have a chapter in your middle school or your high school or uh, in your college in terms of PBL, contact us at uh, the National Center. We'll send you materials on how to go about starting that and um, get out there and ask uh, your business teachers in your school why you don't have a chapter or maybe go to the, one of the guidance counselors and ask them if maybe there was one at one time and how do you get that um, reinvigorate it uh, in your school or start it for the first time. That's, that's what I would suggest. Perfect. That's great. I hope you guys took that down and are able to reach out if you do have any questions or thoughts about getting into FBLA or anything like that. And that's all we have for today, Mr. Graham. Thank you so much for being on the episode. I really appreciate it. And our conversation was amazing. So thank you so much. Thanks, Lucas. It was a lot of fun. Great.